This is the Rich Dad Radio Show. The good news and bad news about money. Here's Robert Kiyosaki. Hello, hello, hello. This Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Dad Radio Show, the good news and bad news about money. And of course, that song comes from Goldfinger, the James Bond film when I was a kid. I loved, I loved the James Bond movie, but it was about Goldfinger. And that's a hint to let you know that today is about the subject of gold and silver or precious metals. And, um, you know, what this, the saying that is said from one of our guests today is gold loves cheap money. And you, you, as you may know, if you've listened to a Rich Dad or read Rich Dad, the thing, the a big part of why Rich Dad was created was in 1971, President Nixon took the dollar off the gold standard and money became cheap. And so today, it's one of the biggest ripoffs I've ever seen is all these people are working for money, saving money, investing their money, and people are just ripping them off via their money. In other words, money is making them poorer. So the harder they work for it, the more taxes they pay and the poorer they get. So anyway, that's why the Rich Dad Radio Show, Rich Dad was created in today's Rich Dad Radio Show is come, I'm gonna talk to two of the people I trust the most in this subject of gold. And it's a very exciting subject because gold, you know, it's going up and down as anything does because it's manipulated, but it's around 1,400 an ounce. And just uh, 20 years ago, it was like 350 or 250 an ounce. And now it's up so many percentage points, but nobody's watching it. And then silver hit 15 an ounce. And silver actually is the cheapest thing in the world today because a number of years ago, f silver was $50 an ounce and it's only $15 an ounce. So everything has gone up, but silver hasn't gone up. Does that mean you should buy it? Of course not. But anyway, today, please pay attention. Very important show about gold and silver. Any comments, Kim? Yeah, well, it, yes, I do because, you know, Robert, you and I love to have our gold supply and it does it does and silver and, and silver. silver and it does surprise me how people think that that is so risky and what you're saying is the dollar's get losing value more and more but nobody seems to uh, they think gold is risky so here's what I see happen all the time I see people who have bought gold not a lot of gold but some gold and every day they go oh the price is up the price is up oh that's great that's great oh the price is down oh no 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 but nobody knows why Nobody knows what causes it to go up and what causes it to go down. So we've got two experts today and silver as well, two experts who are going to give us some, some indicators of what to look for and what's coming in their opinion and their expertise. Because instead of just saying, oh, it's up, oh, it's down, I want to know why. Yep. So our guests today are Brian London, editor and publisher of a gold newsletter. He's the host of the oldest most respected gold investment event conference. It's called the New Orleans Investment Conference. And I love that show. I love that conference because I learned so much. I mean, Brian has some of the best speakers in the world, like me there, and other speakers. And also our other guest today is Dana Samuelson. He's the president of American Gold Exchange. He operates out of Austin, Texas. And Dana was also the past, he's just past president of Numismatics. Now, if you don't know what numismatics is, stay tuned because it's a very important segment of investing for gold. So for all of you right now, I think, you know, you may have seen me on TV for a competitor of some of these guys. <laughs> but I'm saying I love silver because of all the so-called asset classes in the world today, silver is still minus 70%. It's still undervalued from where it was back in 1980, I believe, when I was I first got on to silver. So anyway, again, our guests are Brian Lundin, editor of, and publisher of the Gold Newsletter. Please subscribe to it. And Dana Samuelson, his website is amerigold.com, A-M-E-R-G-O-L-D.com. So Brian, welcome to the show. Dana, welcome to the show. Welcome, you guys. Thanks for being here. Great to be Thank with you. Thanks for having us. So, Brian, since you're the uh, old guy in this whole thing, <laughs> not really, but anyway, you have you, ha you have the most history because you were there because when I first started buying gold, by the way, if you can plug my book, Fake, I started buying gold in 1972. I had to go to Hong Kong to buy a Krugerrand, and I paid like 50 bucks for it. But when I bought that Krugerrand, I was now a criminal. I had to smuggle it into the country. 
And it was illegal in 1972 for Americans to own gold. So Brian has been with that transition. He worked with the gentleman that got to have made gold legal for Americans to own. So Brian, could you give a brief rundown what happened in the transition from being gold being illegal for Americans to legal? Yeah, absolutely. You know, both Dana and I actually worked for Jim Blanchard, who was an absolute icon in the, the gold industry. People call him the original gold bug. And he started Gold Newsletter in 1971 on the exact day once when he heard that President Nixon closed the gold window. And what the gold window was that even though it was illegal for American citizens to own gold, foreign countries could still exchange their dollars for gold. And uh, de Gaulle, of all those people in France, was so crafty, he realized that with the United States spending so much money on Vietnam and bread and, you know, guns and butter and the welfare state, that the dollar was getting cheapened. So he sent all of the dollars they had, as many as the U.S. would take, and was taking the gold out of Fort Knox. So Nixon put a uh, kibosh on that, closed the gold window, and took the dollar completely off of any tie, severed any tie to gold. And what happened at that point was that the central bankers, especially in the U.S., could then print and spend with abandon. They really had no restraint whatsoever. And they were like uh, teenagers given a, a bottle of Jack Daniels and the keys <laughs> to the car. You know, they immediately ran the car into the ditch, which was the 1970s. And, uh, and since then, they've been doing, you know, they've been a little more careful. But every time there's any kind of a economic slowdown, they immediately lower interest rates. And the last crisis in 2008, they actually had to start printing money. So that's, that's kind of why the, the value of the dollar, especially since then, has been on a fairly steady decline. And gold, although there's been a bunch of waves in the line and jigs and jags, has steadily been increasing in value relative to the dollar. And uh, so, you know, along the way, uh, Jim Blanchard started the New Orleans Conference to teach people how to invest in gold. He did that in the early 70s. He started Gold Newsletter in the early 70s. And, and we've been trying to get the uh, story out and help people make money as gold uh, kind of gradually and in fits and starts, but continues to, depreci to appreciate against the dollar. Right. And the New Orleans Investment Conference is, is such a fantastic educational event. It's not for techies and those guys who are into the stock market. It's for guys who are into what I call hard, tangible assets. Right. So it's, it's like food, it's like gold, oil, and things, and even real estate there. So it's a very um, educational conference, and I learn a lot going there. So uh, Dana... Give us your story. How did you get into this insane subject called gold? <laughs> well, it's uh, kind of curious. I uh, graduated from college in 1980 with a German degree, of all things, uh, when oh, interest helps. rates were 18, 19 percent, inflation was 18, 19 percent, on the heels of the U.S. becoming uh, really the first fiat money printer in the world when we went off the gold standard in 1971, and I was completely unhirable. But I got a job uh, in a vault working for a company in Houston, Texas, counting, shipping, and weighing because I could be trusted. And we were selling a lot of coins to Blanchard and Company in New Orleans at that point in time, and I was offered a job uh, over there to learn how to appraise old classic gold and silver coins minted 1933 and earlier. So I became a numismatist which is a big word for a coin nerd. Uh, so I learned how to appraise old coins and went to work for Jim. Uh, Brian came to work uh, about the same time I did, and we both learned uh, the history of gold and silver from Jim Blanchard, who is basically the godfather of our business. And you know, I've worked my way up the ladder, and I started my own company in 1998 uh, when I felt I had enough experience and knowledge and it was right at the bottom of the gold market, as you said at the top of the show. You know, gold was at 250 an ounce when we balanced our budget for the first time in 20 years in 2000. And it's done nothing but go up since then, as the whole world has done, especially since 2008, 
what the U.S. did in the 70s, which is print a lot of money. And they keep and, printing and printing and printing. Right. And the debt, the debt just keeps getting bigger and bigger. And, um, you know, I saw an interesting headline on MarketWatch website uh, about six months ago. It said, debt doesn't matter until it does. <laughs> and we're, we're getting closer and closer to the point where debt is going to matter for a host of reasons. Right. So, so, Dana, when you say numismatic, um, you know, people say, oh, I'm going to go buy gold, and they go into a precious metals dealer, um, and maybe the, maybe the dealer is not quite as ethical or just wants to make a lot of money, and they start pitching numismatic versus just a one-ounce gold coin. Can you explain the difference? Yes. So uh, there are modern bullion coins that have men- are minted uh, today that have been minted primarily since the late 60s and early 70s by the South Africans in the form of one-ounce gold Krugerrands. The Canadians started making the one-ounce gold Maple Leafs in 1978. The Chinese started making gold pandas in 1982. These are all one-ounce modern bullion coins that really don't have much value over their intrinsic gold content. They make more and more of them every year. It's like uh, Jay Leno used to say about Doritos, eat all you want, we'll make more. Well, that's what the mints around the world have been doing. So these are just round bars for the most part. They have no value over their gold value. They are exactly that, an ounce of gold. Numismatics, on the other hand, are collector coins, mostly minted prior to 1933 when the U.S. quit making gold coins that have value above and beyond their gold content for collectability, scarcity, popularity. Uh, For the most part in the U.S., these are old U.S. $20 gold coins that we call St. Gaudens that were minted in 1907 to 1933, and then there's a Liberty design minted 1850 to 1907. So these are about one-ounce gold coins, but they were actually $20 bills back in the day before paper money uh, became as prevalent as it is today. So why, let me ask this question. Why was 1933 such an important date? That's all I want. Well, in uh, 1929, the Wall Street crash came. And then to stabilize that, FDR had to do something drastic when he became president in early 1933, and that was to take the gold out of the money. And that's what FDR did. He made gold illegal to own in the United States. So all that gold and silver, not silver, but all that gold that was money was literally confiscated, and it was illegal to own gold in the United States between 1933 and 1974, when our old boss and mentor, Jim Blanchard, helped to get gold re-legalized in the United States uh, at that time. Now, the rest of the world, it was fine. You could own gold in Europe or Asia and uh, in Switzerland or in Japan or China, uh, India. There is gold culture, and gold is money. It's been money forever, and there's a much higher gold culture than there is in the United States. But to stabilize the economic situation then, um, Roosevelt had to do something drastic because people didn't trust the paper money. They wanted the gold. So he had to take the gold out of the currency, just like de Gaulle didn't trust the dollar starting in the late 60s. I mean, in, in the mid to late 60s, if my memory's right, we had 11 or 12,000 tons of gold in Fort Knox. And by the time we got down to about 8,300 tons, I believe is the number, Nixon said, that's enough. We've got to go off the gold standard in 1971. And that led to the relegalization of gold in 1974 spearheaded by Jim Blanchard. So, Brian, you were part of this whole uh, transition. What was, your, mm-hmm. what was your recollection of, what is your comment on numismatic and then buying regular oh. gold coins? Yeah, and, uh, well, first off, you know, Dana just mentioned that FDR took us off of the gold standard, but it was very, it was much more devious than that. He knew that he was going to devalue the dollar, so first he took away the gold from everybody, and then he raised the price of gold from a little over $20 an ounce to $35 an ounce. In, in, in effect, in one fell swoop, he deval- devalued the dollar by 69%. So it was like he was steering the Titanic into an iceberg, saw the iceberg coming, and then went around and took the life reservers from all of the passengers so they couldn't protect themselves. So it was really, really the, one of the, the uh, most 
devious things that a politician has ever done to the to uh, U.S. citizens. But isn't that um, one of the reasons the gold bugs like we, the three of us, are in Kim? Is, we're always afraid that the government's going to come and confiscate our gold. I mean, that's still a yeah. rumor sitting out there, isn't there? There really is. And, you know, I don't think it'll happen, but if something's already happened, you can't deny the fact that it could again. Right. Uh, so that's one of the reasons why some people invest in what's called semi-numismatics. Those are coins that have a lot of gold content and just a bit of collectible value. Uh, typically, they're, they're circulated a lower-grade coins from pre-1933. And the reason why they buy some of that as part of their bullion holdings is because in 1933, when FDR and the, the government confiscated Americans' gold holdings, they exempted collectible coins. So that's the, the idea there is that if they ever do this again, they're probably going to have to exempt collectible coins. So if you have some of these older U.S. coins, you have some degree of protection from that. But like generally, the, uh, in a, in a, I think Dana will agree, if you're going to buy numismatics, do so as a hobby, enjoy the hobby, and that's the way you'll make money at it, by really uh, educating yourself and learning about it um, and collecting for the joy of collecting. And the reason that, that, we, those are the people. Yeah, the reason we say this is when, you know, every, I, I shop different coin dealers in town and stuff like that, and I always pretend not to know what I'm doing, and not all mm -hmm. of them, but a large number of them will try and sell me a rare coin. Why is that, Dana? Well, it's a greater profit margin. Uh, it's as simple as that. Um, you know, if people are interested in buying gold and they don't know much about it, you know, they get steered sometimes the wrong way. Uh, and that's, not self, that's a self-serving mechanism that some unscrupulous dealers do just to make a little extra money or make a lot of extra money. And, you know, the thing about the classic older coins is that they're limited to what was made years and years ago. So some are legitimately worth a lot of money because they're very scarce or popular, while others, you know, trade pretty close to their intrinsic gold value if they're much more common. So, you know, uh, dealers don't always uh, do business at the client's best interest. They sometimes do it in their own really? best interest. Really? Yeah. <laughs> hey, well, anyway, we, we need to go to break, but, we, you know, that the reason I understand this is uh, for the first time a couple of years ago, I started buying numismatics from Dana because at least he could give me an education on what I was buying, what the price was, and all this. Whereas if you know nothing, you know, you just walk in there and they can tell you the song and dance of how rare this coin is and you have no idea what they're talking about. Well, so we, always, we always ask people what their goal is. What are you trying to accomplish? And once we understand that, we try and help them with their goal. And if bullion is more appropriate for what they're trying to accomplish, that's what we offer them. If they're interested in numismatics or want a little leverage to the gold price, uh, sometimes we'll offer numismatics in that case. Okay, so when we come back, once again, our two guests today are Brian London, editor and publisher of Gold Newsletter. His website is goldnewsletter.com. And Dana Samuelson, he is the president of American Gold Exchange, also past president of the Numismatic. How do you pronounce that, uh, Dana? The, the word is numismatics. It's the study of coins. Uh, I was president of the Professional Numismatist Guild, which is the leading organization of rare coin dealers in the okay. country. And his and Dana's website is Amerigold A M E R G O L D dot com. When we come back we'll go into why they're so bullish. They're so optimistic about gold. You know, we have my friend uh, Jim Records. He's calling for gold to hit ten thousand an ounce. And then on the other side of the coin is Harry Dent who is calling for four hundred dollars an ounce. So this is gonna be an interesting discussion because Either you're for gold or you're not for gold. And there's also a lot of interesting things happening with various countries throughout the world in regards to gold and what's going on behind the scenes. So we're going to find out about that as well. Yeah, there's a lot, a lot of gold going, moving around. Games going on yeah. right now. Yeah. So we'll be right back. Welcome back, Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Dad Radio Show, the good news and bad news about money. You can listen to the Rich Dad Radio Show anytime, anywhere on iTunes or Android. 
And all of our programs are archived at richdadradio.com because we don't make any recommendations. For example, I'm not saying buy gold or silver or sell gold and silver. But we archive that so that you can listen to this program again because repetition, you'll learn even more the second time you listen to it. But more importantly, have friends, family, or business associates listen to this program about gold. And if I could shamelessly promote my book that just came out, it's called Fake, Fake Money, Fake Teachers, and Fake Assets. There's a lot of misunderstanding about this subject called gold and silver. And a lot of people will st are still saving money. I mean, if you read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, you have gotta be an idiot to save money. Yet that's what everybody's doing or working for money. Why would you work for something they're printing? It doesn't make sense to me. So anyway, the book is called Fake. Please read it, but listen. have your friends, family, and business associates listen to this program again about gold on richdadradio.com. Once our get, again, our guests are Brian Lundin, L-U-N-D-I-N, editor and publisher of Gold Newsletter, host of the infamous New Orleans Investment Conference. For all you guys who go to the tech shows, you may want to go back to the old world and watch New, go to the New Orleans Investment Conference because that's really where the base of the economy emirates from. It has food, it has land, water, gold, oil. It's the fundamentals of the economy. And uh, Brian London's website is goldnewsletter.com. Our other guest is Samuel Dana Samuelson, D-A-N-A. And he's a president of American Gold Exchange. He's a pre he was a president, past president of Numismatic Society. And his website is amergold.com, A-M-E-R-G-O-L.com. Very important, we're gonna find out now why they think, why they're bullish on gold. You know, why is Rickard saying 10,000 and uh, Harry Dent saying 400. Any comments, Kim? Yeah, well, I, I want to go to Dana because I've just read in this article, Dana, I want to read it to you and get your comments on it. It said that the Federal Reserve, in its effort to boost the U.S. dollar, has deliberately kept the price of gold at artificial bargain levels. China, Russia, and other countries are taking advantage of the Federal Reserve's policy by buying gold on the cheap. And you say gold loves cheap money. So what's what's going on? Gold loves cheap money. Russia, China, Turkey, they're all buying, stockpiling gold. What's going on? Well, since the uh, financial crisis of 2008, uh, we've seen a, a, a big trend shift with central banks around the world accumulating gold as a hedge against counterparty risk, which is on an institutional level, this is not Bear Stearns or Lehman Brothers or anymore. This is China, India, Russia, um, Japan. They're buying gold. The central banks are buying gold to pr protect themselves as a hedge against counterparty risk with other currencies. When you say counterparty risk, what do you mean by that? Well, uh, debt is an obligation to pay. Yeah, let me and give you an example. That's lending your brother-in-law $100,000. That's highly counterparty risk. It's only as good as your brother-in-law. That's really what it means. And all stocks, all money has counterparty risk. Gold does not. That's why I say in my book, fake gold and silver are God's money. God is a co-center on gold and silver. So please continue on, Dina. Well, I, I love fake, Robert, because it is such a good book to explain to people uh, why gold is God's money why teachers aren't teaching the right things in school, and why most assets are manip manipulated much more than the gold and silver price have been. Um, but back to Kim's question, you know, the dollar is the world's reserve currency, and gold is priced in dollars. So as the dollar gets strong or weak, uh, gold tends to trade at an inverse pattern to the strength or weakness of the dollar, because as the dollar goes up or down, the gold price goes up or down in other currencies. When the dollar's weak, gold is cheaper in other currencies than when the dollar is strong. So we've gone through a period where the dollar has been inordinately strong because the U.S. economy has been the world's leading economy since about 2013, 14, 15, helping to bring the other economies of the world up as the world's largest and most vibrant transparent economy. Now, China's become the number two economy in the world. The European zone is about one-third of the global economy. But what we've done is created so much debt in the world today that we're not going to be able to pay it back. We'll talk a little bit more about that, I assume, in a few minutes. Okay, but Dana, what's happening now... Dana, can I add something to that? Gold is relative. 
for example, my, dollars are pouring into the U.S. because we are kind of a safe haven. So the dollar gets stronger. That means the price of gold doesn't go that go that high. But if you're living in Venezuela right now, your currency is so weak. Gold is much more expensive. So go, the price of gold varies to the currency of the country you live in. So that's why if I was in Venezuela right now, I, I wish I would have wished I had bought a lot of gold. And what Dana and both Brian are saying is before the United States becomes Venezuela or Zimbabwe, buy gold now while the dollar is strong. Is that correct, Dana? Yes, yes. It's good for Americans to buy gold while the dollar is strong. If the dollar weakens, the gold price is going to go higher. And what we've seen over the last two months, which has helped gold to break over 1370 an ounce, is uh, bond yields plummeting around the world. In the U.S., uh, the 10-year Treasury has gone from 2.5% to under 1%. I'm sorry, under 2%. It's right about 2% now. Australia, the U.K., Japan, and Germany, all of these bond yields have plummeted, which means people have been buying bonds very uh, heavily as in a flight to safety. And you know, the, the old expression goes, smart money follows the bonds. And this is clearly a sign that we're facing a bit of a global economic slowdown, whether it's a real contraction or leading to a recession, we don't know yet. But money is getting cheaper as measured by what the yields are. And that's why I say gold loves cheaper money, uh, because it doesn't have to compete against for returns against a CD or in an environment where stock markets are pretty toppy. Uh, you know, gold doesn't have to compete as hard when money gets cheaper like it's been getting cheaper. And that's the value of the dollar versus other currencies as well as, you know, what people can invest in, like right. treasuries. So, so, Brian, I mean, obviously you've been a gold bug and a gold bull for all these years. What is your crystal ball saying and why are you bullish on gold and or silver? Well, it's debt, really, Robert. I mean, it, if you look at the debt loads in the U.S. and every developed economy around the world, uh, it's inevitable. It's just a matter of simple math. You know, in a, in a few years, we're going to be paying. If we aren't already, we're actually going to be borrowing just to pay the interest on the national debt here in the U.S. And throughout human history, this is, you know, this is nothing new. Going back to the ancient Romans, going back to ancient Greeks, civilizations throughout human history over and over again have overspent their means on wars or entitlements or or whatever and to and they've created debts that they can't handle any other way so what they've done every time is they've depreciated or devalued the currency that those debts are denominated that makes the debt that, cheaper exactly exactly so that's that's the age old that's the only prescription over and over again. So let me explain what, so, what let me explain what Brian is saying. You know, just before the crash of 2008, there were people who were refinancing their house to pay off their credit cards. And that's what the US government is doing right now. They're refinancing yeah. the future to pay off the debt they've already money they've already spent. So that's why Brian and Dana and people like myself and Kim are optimistic that the U.S. government is so upside down when it comes to paying their bills. They're borrowing money to pay their bills. What does that mean for gold or silver? Is that correct, Brian? That's exactly true. And, and the only difference now than, than from previous times throughout human history is that now it's an interconnected world and every country is in the same boat. So everybody's trying to, they're racing to the bottom of the hill in terms of their currencies, and everybody's trying to competitively devalue against every other currency. And so, that's what that's what Jim Rickers wrote the book, Currency Wars. If the mm -hmm. dollar is so strong, China and Mexico and Canada and the Europe cannot buy our products. So by, so by so, Russia and China and India buying gold, does that, doesn't that help to devalue the U.S. dollar? Well, to some degree, what they're trying to do is get strategically positioned where they're not at the mercy of the U.S. dollar. They're kind of looking ahead and seeing the, the debt loads and problems in the U.S. and seeing the U.S. as the world's reserve currency has a special burden to bear uh, in, in, in these kinds of situations. So 
they're saying that the dollar cannot be worth what it's worth now down the road, and they want to kind of insulate themselves or be, become independent from the uh, from the dollar's role. What in, they're in what the they're world. basically saying is U.S. is borrowing money to pay off its past debts, and the debts yeah. they're going to borrow for, like the pensions and entitlements and student loan debts, are only going to get bigger and bigger and bigger because it goes back to 1971 when Nixon took the dollar off the gold standard and the dollar basically became credit or debt, as you call it, and they can print as much as you like, which is why the Rich Dad Company was formed, why we say the rich don't work for money. Why would you work for money when they're printing it? It doesn't make sense to me. Mm -hmm. So that's why Kim and I own silver and gold. So, Dana, anything can add to this um, borrowing money to pay off the bills? <laughs> Well, uh, debt has just exploded. You know, in 2008, the amount of debt in the world was about $99 trillion globally, and it's, it's about double that now. In a time when we've had a relatively healthy world economy and low interest rates, and, you know, the political will in the United States to fix something doesn't really happen until it becomes horribly broken. So we're going to keep adding to our debt load, which will keep... Um, causing our interest payments to go higher and you know we're going to spend more on interest very soon if we're not already than we're spending on military in the United States and that's never happened before you know there's an economist by the name of Lacey Hunt uh, here in Austin who works for Hosington Capital Management he studied nine economies in the world or saw nine examples over a hundred year period where when a country had a hundred percent of debt to GDP for five years or more, it was impossible for that country's economy to grow GDP at 3% or more a year because the debt service starts to eat into where the money would be spent on research and development or infrastructure. And the U.S. has been in that position for five years now, which is where the tripping point comes. Well, what so the, we're, uh, let me, let me we're give not going to be able to... So, to, so Dan, let me give a comparison real quickly. What Rickards is saying is that 60% debt to GDP... That's the tipping point. And today we're at 114% debt to GDP. We went past the point of no return. And I think that's what we're saying here. They, we have to keep borrowing now to pay our bills. Exactly, exactly. And this is a recipe for disaster or a much weaker dollar. And gold is the ultimate currency of last resort. That's why people rush to, to it following the financial crisis of 2008 and the gold price, depending on where you start, you know, seven, eight hundred, nine hundred dollars an ounce, more than doubled. Now we've gone through a major corrective phase and it's starting to rise again. So wait, so let's, let's go on because we're all gold bugs here, but let me ask this question. There's two questions. How is the price of gold manipulated? How do they keep it lower? And the second question is, why do so many people hate gold? So let me toss it to Brian. How is gold, the price of gold, manipulated? Uh, through the paper gold market, uh, Robert. Essentially, the, the futures and options markets on gold. There's, there's so much more gold traded through these uh, paper contracts in the futures and options markets than there actually is go physical gold traded in the U.S. And you know, if these trades on COMEX, if you open up a paper gold contract, Supposedly, you can take physical gold, you know, let the contract mature, and then you can go ahead and take delivery of physical gold. Well, at any point in time, there's, uh, there's as many as 150 people who think they own that ounce of gold in the COMEX <laughs> vault. But so that's all, doesn't it also affect the uh, gold and silver ETFs? Yeah. Well, no, it affects the, the marked price on a daily basis of gold. Right, but, lot, that, but a lot of times the ETFs don't have the gold, do they? Well, they, they'll, they'll have statements Fraction. in their prospect, prospectuses that will show that there is a chain of custody and everything else, but it, it, there's a lot of legalese. And the bottom line is, it's not the same as gold in your hand, or gold in your vault, or gold buried and, somewhere that you know where it is. And the and the futures and options, when that contract comes due, they just take it in money, right? They don't. They're exactly. not asking for gold. They're just getting cash or money. Exactly. And and whether they're doing it at the the urging or or orders of the government, or whether they're just doing it to make a buck, 
the, the markets are set up and leveraged so much that these hedgers and speculators can move the price kind of at will. Uh, and they can force it down if they're short, and they can uh, turn around and buy it and drive it back up. And these high-frequency traders, you know, if, if a group has about 120 to $150 million to spend on a bet in gold and some other markets as well that are of the right size, they can make about a billion and a half dollars in the span of 10 minutes. If they pick their spots, they do their algorithms correctly, and they drive the price down, turn around, go long, and drive it back up. It's, it's amazing how these markets can be manipulated these days. And But that's any market, too. That's any market as well. Right. But gold is the right size market. It's kind of a Goldilocks Small. market for this kind of... Uh, High frequency trading and gold is shallow. I mean, there's not there's not very much there's not much of it. Not like stocks and bonds, which are right. deep. So anyway, uh, just so for those of you who watch price of gold going up and down, that has oftentimes only has to do with manipulation. But when you look at the fundamentals, which is what Dana is doing, if the fundamentals are so bad, we have so much debt, Dan, Dana. Why do people hate gold? Well, people are not trained to buy gold in the United States. It's, it's, a, it's a negative investment for the big Wall Street houses that want to sell stocks or bonds or, or anything that will make them money, right? Which is why you wrote Rich Dad in the first place, Robert. People right. are just not educated in this country. Other countries they are, but not in the United States, which is why we call gold the barbaric relic, which it really isn't, uh, but it's just an education uh, well, what, you know what, more than anything. I don't know if you heard Jim Rickards, but what he said was he was the last class of his business school where they actually taught gold. He says right after that, the 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 teachers, the academics, came out and started singing like birds in a choir, saying gold is a barbaric relic. So there was this whole, according to Rickards at least, there was this whole academic case against gold. There was. And you know what Jim says is that he's looking at the same numbers we're looking at, and he's saying that this next debt crisis, the dollar's credibility is essentially going to be trashed, and the only way out of it, the only way that the dollar can regain its role as the world's reserve currency is to back it to some extent with gold. And that even at a minimal backing of, of all the dollars out there that exist right now, even a 20%, just a 20% backing of all those dollars by the U.S. gold holdings would equate to a $10,000 an ounce price of gold, more than five times, almost six, more than six times the level that it's at right now. And that's what keeps so, all, all the gold bugs chomping at their bits. <laughs> exactly. And then there's Harry Dent, who says he's going to go to 400. And I, and I hate to say this to Dana and to Brian, as a pure speculator or owner of gold goes to 400, I'm happy because I'm going to buy even more of it. But it wipes out a lot of people, right? It really does. It And if it does happen, it will be because there's a liquidity event where people just have to sell their gold to, to meet margin calls, like what happened in 2008. Right. And it won't last long. But the, the key difference today from 2008 is that not many of these hedge funds and big money speculators even own gold. So right. they, they don't own it. They can't sell it. So, I, I was listening to uh, Jim Rogers, and he says he's waiting to go back to 800. What do you guys think? Uh I think we've already got a pretty hard bottom in gold at 1050 from December of 2015. Uh, you know, with the gold price moving higher now over 1370 into the low 1400s, anything under 1200, I think, is going to look cheap to people if we get back to that level. So there'll be a lot of buying at uh, 1300. If we go under that, 1200. If we go under that, 1100. It's a long way to 800 dollars from there, unless something. Incredible, it would incredibly have, unusual happen. The whole well. economy would go to pieces if that happened. And and so so Dana for the novice, you know, what are just give us a couple, what are the indicators we should be paying attention to coming up right now? What should we be looking at? Well the biggest factors that impact the gold price in the short term are this the, the relative strength or weakness of the US economy. So if we turn in a really strong GDP number or if the uh, hiring is good, like we had a good number this past week on jobs, you know, that tends to put downward pressure on gold. And conversely, if we have weak GDP or a weaker dollar, so 
look at how strong or weak the U.S. economy is doing relative to other economies because we're the leader. We have been and we still are. Um, look at interest rates, where they're going. Gold loves cheaper money. And right now the market is driving, I think, the Fed to react more than the Fed is reacting to what's happening globally, which is an economic slowdown. It's clearly happening around the world. Uh, and I've been saying to myself for a year or two, will we lift the rest of the world's economies up or will they drag us down? Well, based on the numbers that we're seeing now, it feels like we're being pulled backwards by the rest of the world's economies. Uh, the wild card, of course, is the short-term tariffs on China. Whether we lift those or not, come to a, uh, a happy conclusion to that or whether they drag on further. Well, Dana, uh, Dana, Dana, I mean, the whole point here is this. Okay, this is the point because we're an international company. The point here is this, if you own dollars, gold is cheap. You have Zimbabwe dollars, gold is expensive. And so exactly. it's all relative to your money. And the thing I love, I was just in South Africa, I was just cracking up. Zimbabwe is so desperate for any kind of collateral, they're now accepting pigs and goats and sheep oh my. and cattle as collateral because their their money is so worthless. Also, what happened in Zimbabwe last month, or two months ago now, is exactly as Rickards talks about in his book, The Road to Ruin. He talks about they shut the whole system down. They shut the stock market down. They shut the banks down. They shut the bond markets down. And everybody was without money. So the thing is, I know I hate to be a pessimist or all this, but all too often we look at the we look at the you know the ten dollar or twenty dollar move of a price, but we we miss the big picture. So depending the price of gold depends upon which country you live in, and what is the value of the money you trade in. So really that's the lesson, and you know that's the big point of the Rich Dad Radio Show. We're an international company, but to all you Americans right now in the U.S. dollars, gold is cheap. Any final words there, Dana, and uh, we've got to close. It. Brian, Dana and Brian, final words. Um, I agree with what you said completely, Robert, but I think it's also important the direction, and I think that all of the currencies, all the major currencies out there are going to be cheapened because the debt loads right. are so high. So so gold is, is, you know, and we're not telling people to sell everything and buy gold. No. It's just an important insurance policy that everyone should have, a, you know, some of it out there. And, uh, you know, and, and I hope that people will come to our conference this fall and, and look at Gold Newsletter. And if they go to goldnewsletter.com slash richdad, they can actually save a whole lot of money and even get Gold Newsletter at half price. All right. That's just for your, just for your listeners. Oh, thank you for that. And, and, and definitely do attend that conference because years and years ago we were laughing about it. I was one of those guys standing there selling my gold mine and silver mine. And it was, it's an, I wasn't at your conference, but other conferences. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's such an interesting opposite of stock market conferences and tech conferences. And I, I think the biggest thing about Brian and Dana is that you're educators. You want people to be educated about gold. And yeah. so you've got goldnewsletter.com. You've got Amerigold, A-M-E-R gold.com. Um, wealth of information there. So check it out. So final hey, words Robert. there, Mr. Dana. Well, Robert, you taught me that... Uh, being an educator is what I really need to do. Right. But both of the experience that Brian and I have in the marketplace, that's really where we're, where we're really well placed to, to well, help. We're, people we're, now. we're the old guys. We remember when gold was illegal. <laughs> mm -hmm. True. True. I, I think uh, people should think of gold as an insurance policy for the rest of their money. Uh, if you have 5 to 10% of your assets in gold, you have a nice counterbalance against traditional paper assets stocks and bonds and the stock market's clearly looking a little toppy right now uh, could go higher who knows but things change and I think the risk reward ratio is a little high in paper assets and the reward ratio for gold is a little uh, a little low right now I'm sorry it's high for what could happen in the future right. So gold is really an insurance policy, you know, and I'm guilty of what you, most Americans are guilty of, which is being so U.S.-centric and myopic. The fact that you have a worldview, Robert, and can help people understand what's really happening in the rest of the world paints a, bit, a fuller picture of what's really going on in the world. Well, I was Thanks just in Zimbabwe, that. and they had a hard time putting a goat into their safe. <laughs> <laughs> 
So I love I love the extremes, you know. And it's such an interesting time. And I thank both of you gentlemen for being stalwarts and seeing the price of gold go from 35 all the way up now to about 1400 But who's counting? Anyway, thank, thank you to both of you. Thank you, Dana. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. And, uh, thank, thank you, Robert. Thank you, Kim. Thank you. We come back. We're going to the most popular part of our program, which is Ask Robert. We'll be right back. Welcome back, Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Dad Radio Show. Good news and bad news about money. And once again, thank you to Dana Samuelson, President of American Gold Exchange in Austin, Texas. Its website is amergold.com. And Brian London, editor and publisher of Gold Newsletter. He's the host of the New Orleans Investment Conference, the world's oldest and most respected gold investment event. His website is goldnewsletter.com. And these guys are the old guys like me. We've been in gold since before elephants walked, before the holy mammoths walked the earth. But it's a fascinating subject, and in this, we're called gold bugs or barbaric relics of the past. And everybody's jumping into Bitcoin right now. And I cover all this in fake. You know, today there's there's God's money, which is gold and silver, because God's money means gold and silver was was here when the earth was formed, or pretty a long time ago. And then we have fake, we have fiat money or government money, which is a dollar, yuan, yen, and peso. And then we have uh, people's money, which is Bitcoin and uh, blockchain. So you have a lot of choices today, and everybody's an expert on each one of them. Any comments, Kim? Well, I just think now is the time to really get educated about gold more than any time because, as as Dana and Brian both said, that r really what gold is is an insurance policy against a collapse. That's against all it a, is. Against a, a crisis, a financial crisis, and that's a real possibility. So w now more than ever, I think you should learn about gold and go. Well, let me say this. If you trust the government, you know, the U.S. government, the English government, the Japanese government, Australian government, then just save your silly money. You know, save the Aussie dollar, save the yen, save the peso, save the Canadian loonie, save the euro. If you trust your government, I don't trust them. So that's why Kim and I save gold. We don't. Gold is not an investment. And by the way, Rich Dad does not recommend anything. We're an education company. So if you want an investment, you, have, you should talk to Brian as well as Dana. But we don't recommend anything. And when people say, oh, how much gold should I own? Well, Kim and I own a lot of it because if you read fake, we don't need money. We've, we've figured out in fake called an infinite return. We can just print our own money, but that takes some skill. Anyway, depends on who you are, but the, most people say 5 to 10%. I don't know how you measure that. But most financial planners will say five to ten percent. The reason they don't say twenty-five percent is because they don't get commissions on gold. If you just understand, it's always self-interest and everything in the world, and that's why the rich tech company makes we take no commissions and we make no recommendations of what you should buy. So once again, we're now at Ask Robert, most popular of our program. You can submit your question to Ask Robert at richdadradio.com. So Melissa, what's the first question for Ask Robert? Our first question today comes from Kalman in Australia. Favorite book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Aussie, Aussie, Aussie. Oi, oi, oi. says, hi, Robert. Thank you for sharing your wisdom with the world. In your radio program, you say that you buy and store gold, the real stuff, However, most governments around the world have the right to confiscate and acquire your gold when currency collapses. Can you comment on this? Well, that's why we covered that already and uh, with, with Brian and Dana. Because remember, we were around when gold was illegal for Americans to own, so that kind of is a hangover. But also, it's a way for the stock and bond guys to tell you to stay out of gold or real estate. You know, everybody's got self-interest. But, you know, I mean... Do you think they can take our gold away? You know, they did this back in 1933, and Americans were like sheep. <laughs> they did as they're told. Today, we'd shoot the guys. You know what I mean? Nobody's going to say, oh, yes, I'm a good little citizen of the U.S. I'm going to let you take my gold. Or a good citizen of Australia. Yes, I'm going to take you my gold. You know, nobody wants that job to come and try and take your gold. You can take your kids, but they won't take their gold. So anyway, it's a possibility, but that idea is, I think, just a holdover from 1933, but it's also a way for, for people to get you to buy something else and go off the trail. 
Any comments, Kim? Well, I, I think you hit it on the head is that, you know, the stock market and Wall Street and all the financial markets throughout the world, they don't make any money on gold. So, or real estate a lot of the times. Uh, yeah, so they don't recommend it. They actually talk against it. So I think I think that could be just a ploy. I mean, it's always a possibility. Anything's possible, but it also could be a ploy to keep you in the stock market and keep you in the bond market. But another thing, I'm too, gonna keep is, buying. Another thing too is there's a lot of what they call these storage houses in different parts of the world. And the rich have these storage houses. I mean, Kim and I visit them in Switzerland and Singapore and different parts of the world. So the rich don't hold their wealth in banks. I'll tell you that much. They don't trust the banks. So those of you who trust your banks, have a good time. We don't hold anything inside our banks. Only one, only one reason Kim and I go to banks is to borrow money. We don't want to keep our cash there either because one of the talks I'm doing lately is what happens if, as Jim Record says in Road to Ruin, if they shut the banking system down, which they have done. They've shut the banking system down more than they've confiscated gold. So what happens if they shut the banking system down? You're SOL. You're out of luck, man. So the thing, the thing that we have is we have access to money outside the banks and access to our gold, but also to things like firearms, you know, just so they can't take it from us. So anyway, it's, it's a very unstabling time. We've never been here before. That's why 1971 was such an important year because for the first time in history, the whole world is on uneven, shaky footing because it took dollar off the gold standard. Any comments, Kim? Melissa. Melissa, our, what's the next question? Our next question comes from Brian in Waterford, Michigan. Favorite book, Cash Flow Quadrant. I'm a big fan of gold and silver and enjoyed fake. My question is, why do you think the gold to silver ratio is so out of whack? Is gold overvalued compared to silver or is silver just on sale? I tell you what, silver is my favorite of all. Kim and I started off in silver, right? Yeah, we did. We started buying silver coins. As a matter of fact, that's how we put a down payment on our first house. Yeah, <laughs> and we were buying silver for like $1.50 an ounce, and today's at 15 This is the point, sports fans. Gold is saved. Nobody burns that stuff. Silver is burned. It's being consumed all the time. Silver is the last. If you, if you see me on another program where I'm endorsing another gold and silver company, Lear Capital, by the way, on Fox. But I'm talking about silver, and the reason is silver is the last underpriced asset. You know, you should always buy low, sell high. So I stopped buying gold at 1350, but I've always bought silver because I remember I'm so old that silver at one time was $50 an ounce. Today it's $15 an ounce. Everybody in the world can afford silver. You know, you can buy a, a silver coin, a 1960 silver dime for two bucks. So we can, oh, I can't afford it. We go to this coin, goes, I wanna buy a silver coin for two bucks. Everybody can afford it. But the trouble is they've been educated into staying away from gold and silver and they hold this trash called cash. So just remember this, Silver today is 75% below where its all-time high was. It's dirt cheap, and they're burning it all the time. They use it in batteries, solar cells, medicine, water purification. and this, So the con consumption of silver is going up while, while gold is going into storage. So all you people out there think, well, you know, I'll just, you know, I think I'll just rather save the dollar. I like to trust my money or the yen or the euro or the peso. You're an idiot. You're really an idiot. Just look at the charts. So if silver is 75% below its all-time high and they're burning it up because they use it in industry, well, duh, maybe you should buy some. No, no, no. My mommy and daddy told me to save money and savers, you know, are the way to go. Well, don't save the dollar. Don't save the yen. Don't save the euro. Don't save the Aussie. Save silver. Any comments, Kim? Well, you know, too, that, that you say that silver is used industrial, used in solar panels, used in water treatment, all of that. Um, don't you and think? And batteries. And batteries. But also, if there's a slowing economy, 
does that have any effect on the price of silver? Because it's not, and, and I'm sure there's going to be more technologies that are going to in, use silver, but maybe haven't been invented yet. But I just wonder if that has any impact with the slowing economy on Everything the price of silver. Everything has an impact. Every, just look at the price. It's 75% below. It's the cheapest asset you can buy today. No, I think I want to buy Apple at all-time highs. Well, you're an idiot. That's why you want to buy it. You've been sucked in. Sucked in. Oh, I think I'll buy. I can't. I'll, I'll wait to buy gold. I don't have enough money. Well, silver, you can buy silver for 20 bucks. You can buy one ounce silver for 20 bucks right now. No, I can't afford it. You sound like my poor dad. You know what I mean? Bunch of idiots. Look, the world has changed. Please wake up and thank you for listening to. Thank you for your questions. So, ask, so much of questions to ask Robert, and thank you for listening to Rich Dad Radio.